Um, good afternoon to everyone, and thank you very much for coming to this talk. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the analysis of microseismicity from the geyser geothermal field. Um, the reservoir characterization is one of the most important but challenging parts for a successful geothermal operation. And in this context, the inability of measuring direct reservoir properties makes necessary to find a balance between what we can obtain from numerical simulations and the information that we can obtain directly from re the reservoir. So in this context, the combination of passive seismic monitoring techniques and geomechanical analysis can significantly improve the reservoir characterization. And some of the most uh, commonly applied techniques are the relocation of the seismicity that, for example, allows to trace the fluid propagation, the estimation of focal mechanisms and the inversion for the stress field orientation, which provides information on the seismotectonics and also the faulting kinematics. And we can also make use of other type of data, such for example the injection data, to perform an estimation of the pore pressure at the bottom of the well, or even some first estimations on the permeability, which at the end of the day is one of the most important uh, parameters. So in this study, our main goal is to improve the reservoir characterization at the geysers by, analyze, by analysis of uh, induced seismicity occurring at variable injection rates. To do this, we are using data from the geysers that uh, was previously introduced by Pierre Jean. So I will only say that it's a mostly vapor-dominated reservoir during which an approximate rate of 4,000 events per year occur with magnitudes between 1 and 4.5. So here you see the whole spatial distribution of seismicity at the geysers with their depth color encoded. And the main picture corresponds to an enlarged version of the northwestern part of the field. In this study, we analyzed data from this seismicity cluster just uh, right of the, in the east of the cluster analyzed by Pierre Jean. We took approximately five years of data and approximately 1,150 events occurred with magnitudes between 1 and 3.1. As you can see, two wells are injecting fluid right in the vicinity of this area. The first one, Prati 9, started to inject fluid at the beginning of the analyze period. And the second one, Prati 29, started to inject fluid three years later. For this particular site, a very good correlation was found between the monthly seismicity rate of this cluster, here with the gray bars, and the gross amount of fluid injected, here the black line, adding the quantities for both of the wells. There is also a good correlation with the monthly maximum magnitude uh, estimated each month. So in the next step, we estimated the temporal evolution of the stress field orientation, and we focus our analysis in these two injection cycles performed in the reservoir, each of them containing one or two peaks of fluid injection, and some months of more moderated injection before and after. For both of these analyzed cycles, we, ob we observed a significant rotation in the stress field orientation at the time of peak injections into the reservoir. And for the cycle one, you can see the stress rotation here. The solid line is the trajectory of the best solution, and the shaded areas are 95% confidence interval. And one sees that at the time of the peak injection, the stress field rotated by approximately 20 degrees. So these observations confirm the close relation that exists between fluid injection and the reservoir in situ stresses. However, further analysis needed to be done in order to understand what is making a rotation in the stress field at the times of peak injections and what the seismicity can tell us about it. So for this reason, we decided to keep analyzing the seismicity from this cluster. And in the next step, we perform the relocation of the seismicity using the double difference method, HypoDD. And after it, uh, 770 events were left. And for all of them, we recalculated their new full plane solution using the software method FPFIT. Here you see the spatial distribution of this seismicity. The color is encoded with their faulting style, and the size is encoded with the magnitude. So the first that we observe is that the general shape of the seismicity cloud is an ellipsoid with their largest axis parallel to the direction of the maximum horizontal stress. 
which is something that has been observed in many other fluid injection projects. Secondly, we observe that many of the strike-slip events are aligned in the direction uh, northwest-southeast, which suggests the potential presence of a previously unknown local fault in the area. And uh, when one plots the focal mechanisms of these strike-slip events, one sees that many of them have one of their nodal planes aligned in this direction, which again supports this hypothesis. So here we have, we have plotted the spatial distribution of the seismicity occurring within each of the injection stages. So before, during, and after peaks of fluid injection into the reservoir for both of the analyzed cycles. Two interesting features can be seen here. The first one, during the times of peak injections, the seismicity seems to occur on average significantly farther away from the well Prati 9, while before and after peaks injection, the seismicity collapsed back towards the injection well Prati 9, which suggests a pulsation behavior of the seismicity cloud expanding during peak injections and then collapsing back afterwards. The second interesting observation is that during the peak injections, the seismicity tends to better align with the direction of the maximum horizontal stress, while before and after, most of the seismicity seems to occur within this mentioned uh, alignment or potential fault. Then we took a look at the number of uh, seismological properties with time. And in this case, I'm showing the evolution of the focal mechanisms. So in the upper part of this figure, the gray bars correspond to the total seismicity rate, and the black line is the gross amount of fluid injected. And in the lower part of this figure, we have the absolute number of relocated events for each of the um, faulting styles. So what we see here is that at the time of peak injections, the number of normal faulting events is significantly increasing. But surprisingly, the number of strike slip events and thrust faulting events is increasing more than what will be expected by only increasing the number of events. And this can be seen if we plot the percentage of each focal mechanism type with time. We see that during peak injections, there is a decrease in the percentage of normal faulting of approximately 20%. And this percentage is recovered in between the strike slip and the thrust faulting. In the next step, we estimated the V value. We used three different uh, moving windows between 55 and 75 events, here uh, plotted in blue. And the black line is the gross amount of fluid injected again. So for, this, for both of these analyzed cycles, we observe a decrease in the V value at the time of peak injections, which has uh, direct implications for the maximum magnitude that can be expected at the time of the peak injections into the reservoir. And the last parameter that I will show here is the relative stress magnitude from the stress inversion, which is defined in this way, and it is here the orange line. And as you can see, despite of the larger uncertainties associated with this parameter, the R value seems to reflect pretty well the injection performed in the reservoir, and therefore we believe that it might be a useful parameter to estimate the evolution of the state of stress. So two tendencies are observed in this graphic. The first one, there is a decrease of the R value with time within two of the corresponding cycles. And the second one, there seem to be local increases in the R value during the times of peak injection into the reservoir. So we have seen uh, that there are changes in a number of seismological properties during peak injections. And we wonder what might be changing that makes the seismicity to have such a different characteristics. And what we propose that is changing is the influence of the different physical mechanisms governing the seismicity within different injection rates. And so in particular, we propose that the thermoelastic effects are the predominant mechanism inducing seismicity at this cluster, regardless of the injection rates, due to the high temperatures encountered in the reservoir, which overcome 250 Celsius degrees. The thermoelastic effect is suspected to occur uh, predominantly very close to the injection well. And if we will assume the heat to be uh, transported mainly by conduction, no preferential orientation in the fractures is expected to be found. By performing a very simple estimation on the st thermal stresses induced using the formula by Stephen and Boyd, 
We estimated that there might be a change of due to thermal effects of up to 26 megapascals very close to the wellbore wall. But of course, these value, these stresses are expected to attenuate very fastly with distance, and they are also time dependent. However, at the time of peak injections into the reservoir, the pore pressure is increasing and it is expanding farther away from the well, perturbing areas that were not perturbed before, and this is probably why we observe the seismicity farther away from the well. And uh, if, we, if the pore pressure is increasing, it might enhance the slip tendency in the direction of the maximum horizontal stress. From an injectivity test performed in this well, we estimated the change in pore pressure between before and during peak injections in approximately one megapascal. And then finally, we perform an estimation on the permeability, and from it, we derive the thermal and hydraulic diffusivities. And we obtain that the hydraulic diffusivity is seven orders of magnitude larger than the thermal diffusivity. And if we think about in terms of length, characteristic length of each of these processes, it will mean that the hydraulic uh, length of the process will reach three orders of magnitude at least farther away from the well than the thermal process. And if we would like to represent these mechanisms in the Mohr circle, so let's assume an initial stress of normal faulting and let's assume that it's uh, close to be critically stressed. In the case of the thermoelastic effect, cool water is injected into the reservoir and as a result of this uh, injection, the reservoir cool or shrinks. And we compare this shrinking of the reservoir to the contraction that a reservoir suffers due to depletion. And in this case, it is well understood that the horizontal stresses decreases, which in a normal faulting environment uh, results in increasing the differential stress and moving it closer to the failure criteria. In the case of pore elasticity, the situation is a little bit more complicated because several effects are acting superimposed, but at the end, the final conclusion is that the three principal stresses are modified in a different way, and therefore, during peak injections, the stress tensor will have different eigenvectors than before and after, and this might, way, might be a way of explaining why we observe the rotation of the stress field at the time of uh, peak of fluid injection in the reservoir. So this was uh, basically all. In summary, we use seismological and geomechanical techniques to improve the reservoir characterization at variable injection rates using data from one cluster of induced seismicity at the geysers. We observe a number of changes in properties at the time of high injection rate periods. In particular, the stress field orientation uh, change approximately 20 degrees. The contribution of a strike, slip, and thrust faulting events increased. The average distance of the seismicity from the injection point also increased. The relative stress magnitude locally increased, the V-value decreased, and the seismicity seems to be better aligned with the direction of the maximum horizontal stress. So these variations suggested us that uh, probably thermal effects are the main physical mechanism inducing seismicity, while the small pore pressure effects might be significant during peak injections. And with this, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time for questions. Tony. So the question was why we observe a decrease in the V value while usually the people observe the opposite. Well, I guess, uh, for example, the observation by Corinne uh, Bachmann and her colleagues is that during the injection, the V value is larger than after the shot in, but we are not uh, working here with shot in. So it is simply an increase of the peak injection that I think it was not observed before, probably because you didn't have enough events or there was not a maximum in the injection, for example, for the case of Basel. 
But here, uh, I mean, the V value in decrease seems to be real and it can be directly related in the graphic because the maximum magnitude of the events is increasing at these times. And it does not happen only for one cycle of injection, it happens for several. 